It was a battle unlike any ever seen in America before. 60,000 soldiers converging in the farmlands of Northern Virginia. They were driven by passion, politics, and pride, each side fighting with nationhood at stake. It was the battle that brought the reality of war to the American people, a loss of innocence, an end to illusion. Northerners called it the first battle of Bull Run, but in the South where it was fought, it became known as First Manassas. A tranquil air surrounds the Virginia countryside at Manassas National Battlefield Park, southwest of the nation's capital. Site of two battles in the Civil War, it is a place of monuments, memorials, and memories. On these grounds, large armies from each side in the conflict confronted each other for the first time. Here lingers history in a story of war that began on July 16th, 1861. Hallelujah, his soul goes marching on. It was a Tuesday, and 35,000 Union troops were marching into Virginia from their camps around Washington, D.C. They wore a hodgepodge of uniforms some even emulating the Zouave troops of the French Foreign Legion. No one had yet decided one side should wear blue and the other should wear gray. People of the North were still seething with anger over the seizure of Fort Sumter on April 12th by troops of the newly formed Southern Confederacy. The rebels had to be punished. 26 miles away, 22,000 Confederate troops had gathered in Northern Virginia. Now they took positions along Bull Run near the railroad junction at Manassas. Since Fort Sumter, clashes between the two sides had been mere skirmishes. This would be a battle. It was the first battle of the Civil War. In fact, it really was not a battle of soldiers. It was a collision between two armed mobs. They were rushed into battle. They would be soldiers day after tomorrow, but for this battle, they are just scared young men, full of excitement, but underneath it was apprehension and some fear. Union Major Sullivan Ballou was an attorney in Rhode Island before the war began. On the eve of the great battle, he wrote a darkly prophetic letter to his wife, Sarah. I know how strongly American civilization now leans on the triumph of the government. If it is necessary that I should fall on the battlefield for my country, I am ready. Another attorney turned soldier was Confederate Captain Thomas Goree of Montgomery County, Texas, who wrote of the atmosphere on the southern side. You never saw such excitement and enthusiasm in your life as there is here. Our plans are all kept very secret. Each party is awaiting for the other to make the attack. Both sides felt that this was going to be a short war. One battle, six months, it would be all over. Neither side envisioned what was coming. And so they went out not only to start the war, but to end it. One soldier with little enthusiasm was the man selected to command the Union troops on the march from Washington, General Irvin McDowell. McDowell was not a good choice, but then there were no good choices. McDowell had never commanded men in his life. He was a paper pusher, a staff officer. He was skilled enough, however, to see that his troops were not ready to meet the enemy. 
Captain McDowell, being a regular army officer, had very little confidence in the troops under his command. They had not been fully trained. Many had never even fired their muskets up to this point in time. Their officers were equally inexperienced. Many were just politicians in uniform who could barely march their men in a straight line on the parade ground, let alone on the battlefield under fire. But public pressure to attack the South had been growing. The strategic convergence of rail lines at Manassas made it an attractive target for a first strike. President Lincoln tried to soothe McDowell. You are green, it is true, Lincoln told him, but they are green also. You are all green alike. On the Confederate lines outside Manassas, Brigadier General Pierre Gustave Toutank Beauregard was in command. Leader of the troops who fired the war's very first shots, he was known as the hero of Fort Sumter. At West Point, he and McDowell had been classmates. He was certain his opponent's army would outnumber his own, and Beauregard had urged Confederate leaders to give him more troops. I am determined to give the enemy battle, no matter at what odds against us. But is it right and proper to sacrifice so many valuable lives and perhaps our cause without the least prospect of success? Beauregard knew McDowell's troops were on the move from the messages of Mrs. Rose O'Neill Greenhough, a Washington socialite. She had the ear of federal politicians and generals alike. But her secessionist sympathies induced her to work for the Confederacy as a spy. On July 10th, a beautiful young Virginia woman named Betty Duval arrived at a southern command post near Manassas. Who could know she was a spy until she let her long hair fall, taking from it a note from Rose O'Neill Greenhow? The Union Army would march within a week. Six days later, Greenhouse sent the confirmation. McDowell has been ordered to advance. The enemy has assailed my outposts in heavy force. Read Beauregard's telegram to Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Send forward any reinforcements at the earliest possible instant and by every possible means. Those reinforcements would come from the 10,000 men commanded by General Joseph Johnston, 55 miles away in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Johnston, at 54, had been a 30-year veteran of the U.S. Army and was its quartermaster before he left to join the Confederacy. Johnston's troops began boarding trains to Manassas, an historic event in itself. It was the first time in history the rails had been used to transport troops to battle. Johnston's men would even the odds on the battlefield, giving each side roughly equal numbers. The Union soldiers were unaccustomed to long marches, and their movement from Washington took two days. On the morning of July 18th, Brigadier General Daniel Tyler and his men reached Centerville, a village five miles from Manassas. McDowell sent him these orders. Do not bring on an engagement, but keep up the impression that we are moving on Manassas. The order told Tyler to keep his men going straight ahead in the direction of Manassas itself. This would be a diversion from McDowell's larger strategy, which was to swerve his main army around to attack the enemy lines on their right flank. Blackburn's Ford is one of the many places where Bull Run, even today, can be crossed on foot. It was here that General Daniel Tyler would first confront his new enemies. Tyler came to the battlefield after spending years living in the South where he was a successful railroad president in Georgia. But he was a Connecticut native, as well as a 25-year army veteran. So when war came, his loyalties and service went to the North. 
At Blackburn's Ford, Tyler sent his 1st Massachusetts Infantry into action, creating one in many instances of battlefield confusion that would plague the engagement. One of the biggest problems you have at, at 1st Manassas is that there were at least eight entire Union regiments wearing all gray. And this is the case as well at Blackburn's Ford. Adams Hill witnessed the consequences. A Boston native, he was a journalist accompanying his hometown regiment on its first campaign. He wrote of Lieutenant William Smith and how he died. He first discovered the enemy, but doubting from their uniforms that they were hostile, he ran forward shouting, who are you? The answer came, who are you? To which he answered, Massachusetts men. The enemy then cheered violently and sent a volley, by which the lieutenant was killed. The 12th New York came to the aid of the Massachusetts men, and the Confederates, under escalating fire, mounted a counterattack. The Union troops had been ordered to avoid an engagement, but ended up involved in four hours of fighting. The two sides reported at least 120 men killed or wounded. The stage was now set for the bigger battle to begin. On July 18, 1861, Union troops broke off their fight with Confederates at the crossing point on Bull Run, known as Blackburn's Ford. These Northerners were the advance elements of a massive Union army converging on Manassas, Virginia, a critical rail junction where the Confederates had concentrated a defensive force. The Union probe at Blackburn's Ford revealed strength at the center of General PGT Beauregard's eight-mile line on Bull Run. The places where the enemy could cross the stream were well guarded along this front. Union Commander General Irvin McDowell also learned that the terrain along Bull Run was unsuitable for his plan to attack from the south on the Confederate's right flank. But some sort of flanking attack was necessary. Without great numerical superiority, McDowell knew a frontal attack would be unwise. That was a Napoleonic principle in vogue then that basically stated that it took three men attacking to dislodge one man defending. McDowell had, say, 35,000 people. Beauregard should have had no more than 12,000 for McDowell to hope for victory. Uh, however, McDowell was quite aware of Beauregard's strength, at least being comparable to his own. At 2.30 a.m. on July 21st, Union troops were on the march again. McDowell now planned to attack the Confederate left flank instead of the right. But to do it, his men had miles to march as they prepared to envelop the enemy from the north. If all went well, two divisions would be in position at dawn. But all did not go well. What a toilsome march it was through the woods. What wearisome work in clearing away the fallen trees which obstructed the path. The march was necessarily slow. Chaplain Augustus Woodbury, 1st Rhode Island Infantry. The battlefield landmark on Bull Run, known as the Stone Bridge, today is a reconstruction of the original. Not far from here, General Daniel Tyler's division waited that Sunday morning in 1861. At 6 a.m., they would make a diversionary attack at the bridge on the Confederate front. McDowell's main body of troops marching from the north were to attack the enemy flank at the same time. But their slow progress would make them over three hours late, a crucial delay. Three blasts from a cannon were the Union's signal to begin the synchronized attack. 
Defending against General Tyler were men under the command of Confederate Colonel Nathan Evans, a hard-drinking officer who kept a Prussian orderly in tow, carrying a jug of whiskey for him. Coarse and overbearing, Evans was also resourceful. Outnumbered nearly seven to one, he kept his men hidden as they skirmished with the enemy. Eight miles from the battlefield, Confederate Captain Edward P. Alexander was looking through a telescope. Very early in the morning, in the edge of the field of view of my glass, a gleam caught my eye. That gleam came from sunlight reflected from the weapons carried by a massive column of Union troops. I discovered McDowell's columns in the open fields, turning our left flank fully eight miles away. The men under Colonel Nathan Evans would be the first to feel the Union attack, unless they were warned. Captain Alexander was in just the right position to provide that warning. While in the U.S. Army just before the war, he learned the new semaphore system of Albert James Meyer, founder of the Signal Corps. A native of Georgia, Alexander brought his skills to the Confederacy. Now, word of what he saw flashed across the battlefield. I signaled Evans at once. Look out for your left. You are turned. We've been turned! We've been flanked! His warning to Colonel Evans proved to be critically important. Evans suddenly realized the Union attack from across the stone bridge was a diversion. He sent the bulk of his troops scrambling north to meet the Union onslaught. Let's go! Let's get these men moving! Evans acted with speed, but he had only 900 men to face Union columns totaling 13,000. Evans' 900 men did not anticipate defeating the Union column, but they certainly expected to at least delay them, and that they were able to do by sheer aggressiveness. Between these rebel defenders and the approaching Union troops lay a lump of land that was known as Matthews Hill. Now, the horror of war fully confronted the Green soldiers on both sides. Private Elisha Rhodes fought in the second Rhode Island Infantry, the first Northern unit to meet the Confederates. A perfect hailstorm of bullets, round shot, and shell was poured upon us, tearing through our ranks and scattering death and confusion everywhere. But with a yell and a roar, we charged them, driving them into the woods with fearful loss. Rhode Island Major Sullivan Ballou now faced death on the battlefield, as his letter to his wife had predicted. An artillery shell shattered his leg, a wound which proved mortal. Oh, Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flit unseen around those they love, I shall always be near you. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. I think I am gone and wait for thee, for we shall meet again. Momentum shifted as each side charged and countercharged. Rebel Major Chatham Robert O'Wheat led a troop of Louisiana men into action. Wheat, once a successful attorney in New Orleans, became an adventurer before the war. He fought in the Texas War of Independence and was fighting with Garibaldi for Italian unification when he returned to serve Louisiana in the Civil War. On Matthews Hill, Wheat led his men on a charge against the enemy. It was in this attack that Lobado Wheat received a horrible wound. A bullet went in through his one armpit, across his chest, out the other armpit. Wheat's men picked him up, determined to carry him to safety. Lay me down, boys. You must save yourselves, he cried. But they persevered. 
A field surgeon later told him no one on record had ever survived such a wound. To which Wabudo Wheat said, well, I'm going to set the record. Amazingly, he did survive the wound, but he would die 11 months later at the Battle of Gaines Mill. More than a thousand men had been killed or wounded on Matthews Hill. The rebels lost the fight, but gained critical time. The Confederates would soon regroup and with reinforcements be prepared to meet the Union's advance head on. A line of Civil War era cannon today stands silently in the grass on Matthews Hill at Manassas National Battlefield Park in Virginia. On July 21, 1861, guns like these drove Confederate troops from their positions in nearby cover, forcing them to retreat. Commander of the Union Army, General Irvin McDowell, rode among his men, flushed with the thrill of battle. Victory, victory, the day is ours, he cried. They are retreating. He assumed there was ample time to finish off the demoralized enemy. It was a critical miscalculation. McDowell, when he was riding around Matthews Hill, crying out, victory, victory, the day is ours, all he could see was the little picture. He saw Confederates retreating, and he broke military protocol by not organizing his troops that were on hand and following up his attack and take out the Confederates. Five miles to the south, Confederate generals PGT Beauregard and Joseph Johnston surveyed the battlefield. With no fighting along Bull Run where they expected it, Johnston pointed north toward Matthews Hill. The battle is there, he told Beauregard. I am going. Before Beauregard followed, he sent messages down the Confederate lines, ordering masses of troops to march north with speed to join the fight. Intuitively sensing the Union's battle plan, one Confederate commander had already begun to lead his men toward the fighting. He was the remarkable Brigadier General Thomas Jackson, who positioned his 2,400 Virginians on Henry Hill, a mile south of Matthews Hill, to meet the advancing enemy. There was inside this man an intuitive military genius. Some people have it, very few, but Thomas Jackson was one who did. A monument to General Jackson stands on Henry Hill at Manassas Battlefield today. It depicts a larger-than-life figure, still lionized by many in the South. Far less imposing in real life, he'd become a professor at Virginia Military Institute after service in the U.S. Army before the war. Straight-laced and devoutly religious, his students had called him Tom Fool Jackson, and few expected much of him on the battlefield at Bull Run. Jackson deployed his men on a low incline along the broad rolling slopes of Henry Hill. Remaining hidden from the enemy, he waited for just the right moment to strike. He was probably the calmest man on the battlefield here at Bull Run. And I suspect the reason for this is that Jackson was so devout he looked on this battle as the first collision between the Christians and the heathens. He, of course, being on the Christian side, and he had no doubt but that God would be with the Southern cause. At Henry Hill, Confederate General Thomas Jackson was preparing to make his move when he was confronted by General Barnard B., whose men had been decimated earlier on Matthews Hill. They're beating us back, B. cried. But Jackson was unruffled, saying only, we shall give them the bayonet. And now perhaps the most legendary moment of the battle, as General B found the remnants of his men and urged them to rejoin the fight. He rises in the saddle, looks up, points at the hill, 
and says, look, man, there's Jackson standing like a stone wall, valley behind the Virginians. In that instant, Thomas Jackson became Stonewall Jackson, the line inscribed in granite as well as memory to be remembered for all time. The nickname would live on in history, and it is the most famous nickname in American military annals today. But three Southern officers, bystanders to the incident, would later claim Bee's comment had a different meaning entirely. One of Jackson's first orders was to have his men lie down behind Confederate cannon on Henry Hill. If B looked and saw the brigade lying down, and then he said this comment, let us support Jackson, he stands like a stone wall, very feasibly was sarcastic comment. B certainly had reason to be upset that afternoon because his brigade had been cut to pieces on Matthews Hill, but he could hardly take that out on Jackson. I cannot imagine in the middle of a battle, a general frantic to rally his men would stop and say, look, there's some fellow up there's not doing a doggone thing. That doesn't happen in battle. You use a, a sharp cry like that to be a battle cry, to rally the troops. And certainly, I don't think there's any doubt but that B meant that in the most positive nature. The problem with the whole story is we lose the storyteller. Right after B made this comment, he was shot in the lower bow and taken from the field, and he died later that evening. So there was nobody to ask him, what do you mean? Ah! Stonewall Jackson would soon show his skill in the command of men, leading two Virginia regiments against the infantry guarding the guns, he shouted, reserve your fire until they come within 50 yards, then fire and give them the bayonet, and when you charge, yell like furies. Now the infamous rebel yell was heard on the battlefield, and in moments, the two sides were entangled in a combat boiling with hatred. It was a fight that would turn the entire battle inside out. A single row of cannon on a single battlefield on a single Sunday in the summer heat. At such places and times, history takes its fateful turns. The cannon, once commanded by Union Captain James Ricketts, were known as Ricketts Battery. But on the afternoon of July 21st, 1861, the position was about to be taken by soldiers from Virginia of the Confederate States of America. A bloody fight was in progress. Private Lewis Francis of Brooklyn found himself at the mercy of two Confederates. They kept bayoneting me until I received 14 wounds. One then left me, the other remaining over me when a Union soldier coming up shot him in the breast and he fell dead. On a roadway nearby, the confusion over uniforms surfaced once again. Colonel Jeb Stewart, one of the South's premier cavalrymen, rode out after some retreating federal troops, dressed in Zouave uniforms, which some Southern men wore as well. Don't run, boys, we're here, he called. But suddenly he recognized their stars and stripes and ordered a charge. Confederate Lieutenant William Willis Blackford joined the attack and remembered one of his victims. I could not help feeling a little sorry for the fella as he lifted his handsome face to mine while I tried to get his bayonet up to meet me, but he was too slow. I rammed the muzzle of the carbine into the stomach of my man and pulled the trigger. The carbine blew a hole as big as my arm clear through him. Shoot 
need to get her in place! Quickly, boys, we're on the hill! Atop Henry Hill, control of Ricketts' guns became the focus of the entire battle. A sea of gray enveloped the terrain as the Union's 11th Massachusetts Infantry advanced, their uniforms uncannily similar to their enemies. The Yankees faced a hail of fire from the Virginians. Henry Blake, a young soldier from Dorchester, Massachusetts, witnessed the bloodbath. A cannonball severed the arm of a sergeant and threw it into the face of a soldier who supposed from the amount of blood upon his person that he was dangerously wounded. One man stumbled and a solid shot passed over him and killed his file leader. The ghastly faces of the dead and the sufferings of the wounded who were begging for water or imploring aid to be carried to the hospital moved the hearts of men who had not by long experience become callous to the sight of human agony. Despite Union attacks, the hilltop guns repeatedly fell into the hands of the rebels. They were Virginians under overall command of General Thomas Jackson, and they were holding the position. Jackson, remarkable under fire, stood resolute throughout the fighting. Had not Jackson been on top of the hill, the Union forces unquestionably would have seized Henry House Hill. It was the dominant eminence in that area. The battle might well have been won. So Jackson's stand there on Henry House Hill, to me, is critical. By 4 p.m. on that Sunday in July, the fighting had been going on for 10 hours. Confederate General Johnston had two fresh regiments ready to attack. He sent them to the west of Henry Hill, where they began to advance. A mile away, Union Colonel Oliver Howard received orders to rush his troops forward. Howard's men had to sprint the distance. In the heat of the July sun, many were exhausted before they even reached the action. When Howard's men arrived, as so often happened that day, they found themselves in the open and their enemy firing from concealed positions in the woods. Private George Bicknell of Maine recalled the futility of the fight. Fire? At what? About 500 yards in our front was a belt of woods, though not a Johnny in sight. Into this wood we poured our volleys, though wholly ignorant whether our efforts were of any use or not. But what is that? Clear ring the words. Cease firing. About face. In retreat, march. It was a crucial mistake, and may have proved to be the climax of the battle. What Bicknell heard was the call for a tactical retreat in a single segment of the Union line. But in moments, the entire regiment was in flight. Sometimes you don't have to hear the command to fall back. If you see the others next to you falling back, you feel it probably the order was intended for the whole line. And sometimes even if the order is heard, it's not necessarily known who the order was intended for. If you hear the word retreat, that's what you do. In a catastrophic domino effect, federal troops everywhere began to flee as the Battle of First Manassas reached a dramatic conclusion. The entire Union army was on the run. In the late afternoon on July 21st, 1861, on the battlefield near Manassas, Virginia, the Union Army was in headlong flight. Many have called it a rout. Private George Bicknell of Maine, whose regiment had just followed a mistaken order to retreat, remembered the fear he felt and how it energized the men around him. How we traveled. Nobody tired now. Each gave us special attention to the rapid momentum of his legs. 
Exhausted, scared, surprised, humiliated, the Union soldiers ran. With Southerners in pursuit, it became known as the Great Skedaddle, the Bull Run Races. Civilians from Washington who came to watch the battle suddenly became obstructions in the mass exodus. Their presence on the battlefield, perhaps exaggerated, has today become mythical. Contrary to popular legend, there really were not this flood of spectators on the battlefield. There probably were uh, scores or maybe a hundred. They came down to watch the Confederates run away. They thought that the Union Army, the Grand Army, would come here, fire a couple shots, and the Confederates would throw down their weapons and run away. With such expectations dramatically reversed, Congressman Alfred Ely of New York was stranded near the battlefield and suddenly seized by troops from South Carolina. A captain introduced him to their colonel, the irascible EBC Cash. Ely later recalled the confrontation that followed. The colonel, in a most angry tone, replied, drawing his pistol and pointing it directly at my head. God damn your white-livered soul. I'll blow your brains out on the spot. The captain exclaiming, Colonel, you must not shoot that pistol. He is our prisoner. The famous photographer, Matthew Brady, was also among the civilians caught up in the retreat. The fast flight forced him to leave his equipment behind, so he had no photos of this battle. It is said that fleeing soldiers who caught sight of the brass cylinder on Brady's abandoned camera mistook it, in their fear, for a rapid-fire steam cannon rumored to be in the rebel arsenal. Rebel cavalry and artillery harassed the Union retreat, but Confederate General PGT Beauregard was unable to manage a full-scale pursuit. The Confederates certainly tried to make uh, an effort to pursue the Union Army, but uh, they were nearly as exhausted as the Union forces were, and they had very little ammunition left to sustain an offensive uh, movement. Once darkness fell, it was impossible for the Southerners to overtake the Union Army, and the battle was over. A summer rain fell that night, rinsing blood from the bodies in the field, and confronting a divided country with the horror of war. Many, of course, thought it was not going to be a long war, and this would be a chance to win some adventure, some excitement, uh, win some honor and glory, and come home heroes all in a few short months. Uh, it was a thing to do, and many, again, really did not anticipate the bloodshed and the carnage that would follow. 1,500 Union soldiers were killed or wounded in the fighting, as were 1,900 rebels. Though future engagements with thousands dead would dwarf these figures, this battle was a shock to both sides. In Washington, weary Union troops straggled in from Virginia. A new resolve would grow in the North as it prepared for what would be a long war. President Lincoln accepted the blame for his army's defeat. Mr. Lincoln came out to the army camps and he reassured the man by saying, what happened yesterday was not your fault, it was my fault. I equipped you poorly, I sent you into action too soon, you were not ready for it. The same Virginia countryside would become the scene of the Second Battle of Manassas in August 1862. Here, the massive scale of the Civil War was more apparent. Almost 125,000 troops took part, with 19,000 killed and wounded. The Confederates were once again the victors. Four days after the first battle, Irvin McDowell was relieved of his high command. After spending the rest of the war in lesser posts, 
he continued on in the regular army and retired as a major general in 1882. Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard became a state official in Louisiana after the war. In his writings, he openly quarreled with ex-Confederate President Jefferson Davis on their differing views of events in the conflict. As the war went on, General Stonewall Jackson became perhaps the most distinguished Southern commander next to Robert E. Lee. Jackson was struck by accidental gunfire from his own troops at the Battle of Chancellorsville in 1863 and died a week later. Union General Daniel Tyler, who opened the preliminary engagement at Blackburn's Ford, returned to the South after the war. He resumed his career as a railroad executive and founded the town of Anniston, Alabama. Major Sullivan Ballou of Rhode Island, whose letter to his wife presaged his death, was buried in a shallow grave at Bull Run. Enraged rebels desecrated the site and mutilated the body. Union troops recovered Ballou's remains in 1862. The young Massachusetts soldier Henry Blake, who witnessed the horrible carnage from artillery fire on Henry Hill, moved to Montana after the war. He had a career in law and became the first Chief Justice of the Montana Supreme Court. 51 years after the battle, Barry and Zettler, the retired superintendent of public schools in Macon, Georgia, wrote an account of the fighting for his students. In 1861, he was a private serving in the Confederate Army. I shall never forget the feeling that it came over me as I walked among the dead that afternoon. Surely, surely, I said, there will never be another battle. It seemed to me barbarous for men to try to settle any dispute or controversy by shooting one another. And now that it had been realized what a battle meant, I felt sure there would never be another. Private Zettler survived the many battles that followed. 650,000 other men in the war between the states did not. <laughs>